it's a very picturesque area and it has a very unique landscape. There's moorland, woodland, steep slopes and the farmland. It's all permanent pasture and it's just a lovely area. There's actually 14 reservoirs in the area. In the 1950s, Sheffield Corporation at the time used to run bus tours around this whole area and they coined the name the Sheffield Lakeland because it's such a scenic, beautiful area. It's the back garden for Sheffield. A lot of people use it for their recreation. It's a great place, you can get to it easily. It's a wonderful landscape, a mixture of moorland on the tops and you know valleys with rivers. The Sheffield Lakeland landscape area is just a great opportunity close to such a, a large urban population for people to get out and experience some of the uh, the countryside that our wonderful county has to offer. It's just a really beautiful transition between the city and the moors. This series of uh, steep sided valleys going down in Sheffield are a great resource for the area for ramblers, people to walk out, people to experience the environment but also are a good um, ecological background to the city. Here the top of the catchment sits within the city boundary and actually the Lakeland Partnership forms a really important part of the city. It's like a green lung for Sheffield. Water plays a really important role in this area. The reservoirs were built to supply water to the people of Sheffield. It's an essential part of everyday life, provision of water. But it also has positive additional features as well such as biodiversity enhancement so you've got a whole ecosystem reliant on that water system, whether that be in the reservoirs themselves or in the rivers interlinking with the reservoirs. Water's pretty critical for life, but water isn't just for supporting human needs, it's also supporting the needs of all sorts of different animals, birds, bats, water vole, a lot of insects. And it's not just about water in reservoirs, it's also about water on a smaller scale that links to the reservoirs. So things like uh, your ditches, ponds, scrapes, areas of wet grassland, wet woodland, all creating a mosaic of habitats where different creatures can find their niche and help to improve and increase biodiversity in the area. The Working With Water project which we're working on, it's all about looking at how water is managed in the landscape. We're looking at ways that we can help reduce flood risk problems, ways that we can uh, improve water quality and address pollution, and also looking at how we can improve habitat for wildlife. If you know Sheffield, you know it's basically a big bowl. So the rain falls on the hills and drains into the centre through the rivers. In this part of Sheffield, all the rain that falls around here will end up going to the upper Don, and then flowing into the River Don, down to the city centre, to Meadowhall and, and beyond. Sheffield is very much prone to flooding. When it rains, it seems to rain. Wind, you seem to get it for days upon days. It does seem extreme, the weather. It has always been, you know, unpredictable, but in my eyes, it does seem different, yeah. As we sort of experience more and more extreme weather and more extreme flood events, as we've seen, in November 2019, again in February 2020, they're becoming more extreme and more regular and nature is part of the toolkit to flood defence. We want to slow the flow of water across the land to make sure that more water is held in the landscape. By holding water up in flood events, hopefully it'll slow the flow down the, the river system and help with some flood alleviation measures into more of the urban centres down in Sheffield and Doncaster, Rotherham. Hard engineering does have its role in controlling floods, but we need to think more broadly and people are generally accepting that we need to look at how we manage the land in the whole catchment, not just down by the river channels. This concept, this idea that the whole landscape is part of the river network and is part of the hydrological network, and is therefore sort of implicit in flood control and flood prevention, not just in the stream next to us, but, but way downstream as well. And that's kind of at the heart of natural flood management. By working up in the upper catchments in the headwaters, we can do lots of small interventions, natural flood management interventions, which will hold back small volumes of water. They're cheap to do. They're not a flood risk to adjacent properties, things like tree planting trees uh, in the land will soak up extra water and their roots will help water percolate into the ground. 
fencing off watercourses, that stops uh, livestock going into them, which means there's no risk of pollution. Also, the livestock are not going to um, compact and trample the soil. If you have taller vegetation, that means it's going to catch the water and really, really reduce the flow. Whereas a heavily grazed field will be like a billiard table and water can just run off it really quickly. We can work on the watercourses by putting in what we call leaky dams. Uh, those are basically logs or bits of wood which slow the flow of water. And that means it's not, when it rains heavily, it's not rushing straight down. It's, it's got a chance to dissipate into the landscape or to soak away. The farming community is really important to us as well because these farmers are really the stewards of this land. They've offered me opportunities to like improve waterways gateways where water runs through. They've fenced me areas out that I've been losing sheep in because it's that wet and boggy. Hopefully in the long run we see a better maintenance of water. The more you can prove you work with the environment, I think the better off as a farmer you will be. The ecosystem services I think have been interfered with quite a lot through the changes in the way uh, we farm our landscape and we manage our landscape. So trying to reintroduce some more natural water flows and slow the flow of water through are going to have knock-on effects, positive effects. So if we re-wet a field and get a good bit of rushy pasture, um, then that will benefit some of the birds like snipe. Lapwing curlew will come and feed in those wet areas. Uh, you might have all sorts of insects suddenly finding that they've got a home and of course they're all part of a big food web. There's a whole load of things that can happen just from doing a bit of tweaking to how we manage some of the landscapes that we have uh, in this local area. Community involvement I think is a big thing. More volunteers getting involved, more local communities and it gets that interaction and that engagement with, with their local environment and therefore hopefully just brings on that love for it and the will to protect that going forward. I've been walking around this side of Sheffield for years and years and years. I just absolutely love it. And now I've got some time, it's great to give a bit back and try and help out to keep the environment in a decent state. Last year it went up to was it 24, 22 degrees or something last February, didn't it? With that, it was about a week of ridiculous. Re yeah, really warm temperatures. Yeah. Where we've got old walls, we're doing repairs, as well as keeping the stock out. It makes a, a wonderful habitat for little animals, reptiles, all sorts of things to live in. What we want to achieve in the face of climate change and the climate emergency and helping to tackle flood risk with increasing severity of storms and rainfall and flooding is working in partnership and I think that is the most important thing that the Environment Agency can do is work with partners like the Sheffield Wildlife Trust um, on schemes like this so we build an evidence base for managing flood risk using nature-based solutions. We want to protect the people of Sheffield and the catchment involves a number of players but we'd like to actually increase that level of investment in natural flood management and develop a good case for that large-scale investment over a number of years. This is the highest I've seen it but even going along there is yeah as fast as high a flow as I've, uh, I've seen it along here. We've got a pressure logger in the bottom of this tube here which is measuring the, the height of the water and then it stores that every 15 seconds. Every month or so we come along and download that data using an infrared link here to the computer uh, and then we can go back and, and use that, feed that into our, into our hydrological models. Using that research we can demonstrate the impact of what we're doing and how it can be scaled up to have a, a genuine big impact on flood risk. These measures and this working with, the, with natural processes can actually reduce the amount of work that we have to do in building conventional flood defences in the city and around the urban areas and hopefully reduce costs because this can be an extremely cost effective way of providing the protection. Obviously the biggest threat that we face as society is the climate emergency so the more that we can invest in natural flood management and large scale ecosystem restoration which provides all the benefits like carbon sequestration then that is a major major tool for helping to mitigate against climate change but also build resilience in our landscapes. The work that we do is going to improve 
the ability of species that depend on wetlands to survive. The more variety we have in the habitats available, the better the biodiversity, the more resilient that landscape will be. If you're going to work in a, in a landscape and, a tra and achieve real long-term landscape change, you need to have a large number of organisations and people in that area involved to work together and then you can set up a legacy for the future and expand this network of better water management all the way across the Loxley, the Rivlin and the Uden and all these valleys which are a vital asset for the Sheffield.